This channel is part of the History Hits Network. I just love dinosaurs. I think they're the most fascinating things that ever existed. For me, studying dinosaurs and learning about them is it's like solving mysteries every day. You're very often the first person who's ever seen the fossil that you're exposing in the Badlands. And uh, this is also very exciting. And I know that people get very passionate about their own fields, but I just can't imagine anybody having a better job than me. relatively little about dinosaurs and uh, that sounds very strange to a lot of people because they know that there are so many dinosaur names out there. In fact, there's about a thousand species of dinosaurs that we know about right now and that seems like a lot. But when you look at the modern world, you realize that there's over 10,000 species of living dinosaurs. They're, they're ones that we call birds. There's over 4,000 species of mammals. There's over 6,000 species of amphibians and reptiles. That's all at one time. We only know of a thousand species of dinosaurs for 150 million history that spans the entire world. We have so much more that we can learn about the species of dinosaurs that existed even. This dinosaur was collected on the Red Deer River. Uh, it was found when I was uh, stopping to take a photograph. This was in the late 1970s. Camera case fell off my camera and rolled down the hill. And uh, when I went down to get the camera case, the camera case had landed on the hips of this dinosaur. <laughs> I'm a vertebrate paleontologist and I specialize in dinosaurs. And I'm one of those kids who grew up always loving dinosaurs and always knew exactly what I wanted to be. And uh, it was quite an unbelievable story in the sense that I managed to get a job doing exactly what I wanted to do in exactly the place I wanted to be, Alberta. Because Alberta is one of the very best places in the world for dinosaurs. In Alberta, we've found, so far, about 100 species of dinosaurs, and that includes more than 40 species out of Dinosaur Provincial Park alone. And this is one of the richest ecosystems known for dinosaurs. Those dinosaurs include many of the most famous dinosaurs, animals like Corythosaurus, the helmeted lizard, Parasaurolophus, the one with the long tubular crest on the back of its skull, Centrosaurus, Chasmosaurus, Triceratops, Tyrannosaurus rex, Gorgosaurus, Albertosaurus, and Kylosaurus. These are some of the major dinosaurs that everybody seems to know as names, and they're dinosaurs from Alberta. I've been very lucky in that my wife, Eva, is a person who's also a paleontologist. Her specialty, though, is, is fossil plants, not dinosaurs. It's like being a detective to try and find out what uh, was in, uh, in these ancient environment. Generally speaking, paleobotany and paleontology is an underrated science uh, because it doesn't appear to be as exciting as dinosaurs and crocodiles, but the fact is that it is as important because if it wasn't for the plants, there would have been no dinosaurs. We have about 20 Centrosaurus bone beds in the park. I have a wonderful job. Officially, I'm a professor at the University of Alberta, but I'm also a curator of the dinosaur collections at the university, and I do a lot of teaching. I, of course, train graduate students, uh, people who want to become paleontologists themselves. But the fun part really is getting out in the Badlands and looking for dinosaurs. Dr. Philip J. Curry is my professor at the University of Alberta. He's also my graduate supervisor. And Phil is a living legend. He is a generalist, one of the few dinosaur generalists that's still around. By that I mean he doesn't just study one kind of dinosaur, he doesn't just study one aspect of dinosaurs, he studies everything. He's worked on horned dinosaurs, he's worked on duckbills, of course he's worked on tyrannosaurs, he's worked here in Alberta into Mongolia. He's responsible for finding some of the very, very first feathered dinosaurs and describing them. So I found uh, this bone down here in, the, in this washout from the rainstorm. 
and I first thought it was a vertebra, but uh, when Phil, he pulled it out, it turned out to be uh, the occipital condyle from a, a centrosaur. Dr. Eva Koppelhaus is also one of my professors at the U of A. Eva is uh, wonderful. She is sometimes given the nickname of Quarry Mom, and she's the one that looks after us out here in the field. <laughs> he said, be careful, and then he's running down the hill. We take our students out to Dinosaur Provincial Park to train them in the uh, field techniques, what dinosaur bone looks like in the field, what's important, what's worth collecting, and then how you go about collecting it, how you dig it out of the ground, how you bring it back safely. History Hit is like Netflix, just for history fans, with exclusive history documentaries covering some of the most famous people and events in history, just for you. Whether you're looking to dive into life and crime in Victorian London, or the forgotten history that deserves to be heard, History Hit has a documentary for you, just a click away. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you can't find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Dinosaur Provincial Park is really special because of the fact that it has so many dinosaurs in it. Almost 5% of the world's known species of dinosaurs come from Dinosaur Provincial Park. And when you consider that dinosaurs had a history of more than 150 million years and that they, they're known from every continent in the world, to realize that 5% of all known species of dinosaurs come from this one single place in the world, that's, that's pretty amazing. Well, hadrosaur teeth, turtle shells, croc scoot. Historically, there's been a great divide between where dinosaurs are studied and where they're actually dug up. Most of the major universities and museums have always been on the East Coast. University of Alberta is really changing that. We're a major research institution that's located at a place where we can find dinosaur bones in our backyard. And that's allowed us to really explode. We've produced a huge amount of research in just the last few years. And I really think the University of Alberta is going to be a shining light in paleontology. It's going to be leading the field for many years to come. We spend part of the summer collecting things and then the winter time and the early spring preparing them, stabilizing them, getting them ready for research. So the Dino Lab is really the place where we bring all this, the fossils from wherever we collect them. It's where I've really been able to put my time and effort into getting to know the science better and being able to do the research. The specialties that I'm really interested in would be feather evolution, the evolution of dinosaurs into birds and how that all kind of played out uh, over the millions of years that it took. What I'm working on at the moment is the skull of Sornetholestes. I just removed it from the body a few days ago, and the idea is to uh, prepare it out three-dimensionally. Our students are making a, a big difference in paleontology. We're publishing a lot of papers every year that push forward the, the edge of the sciences. The lab's important too because it gives students an opportunity to come and work on. It could be potentially specimens they found themselves or specimens that they're interested in doing research on. So it's really good for people to be able to come and do some hands-on work. So my work on dinosaur locomotion focuses on understanding how dinosaurs were able to walk and run. And in particular, I actually look at dinosaur tails. And the tails of dinosaurs are really, really important for understanding their motion. When I first actually arrived at the University of Alberta, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to work on. So I spent a lot of time reading papers and looking at popular media of dinosaurs and trying to get ideas. And I came across a picture book um, about ankylosaurs using their tails. And it occurred to me that nobody had really looked at how or why or whether or not they could even swing their tails as weapons. So some of the things that I've already found out are how they could use them, how hard they could swing them, whether they could withstand very like hard strikes against predators. 
some of the things I'd like to understand now are really how and why these structures evolved, how weird things evolve in the fossil record. So I'm on my way to the Royal Ontario Museum to start a postdoctoral research appointment, so that's a two-year research appointment. Um, and the next things that I'm going to be looking at are understanding um, the biogeography of dinosaur groups like ankylosaurs, but also other dinosaur groups. Paleontology is a very, very competitive field. Generally speaking, there are two career paths a paleontologist can take. You can either get on as a curator at a museum, or you can become a professor at a university. Frankly, I would be very happy doing either one. More than ever before, people are doing research on dinosaurs in novel ways, and these research approaches are only possible because of the fact that we have so many people looking at dinosaurs on finer and finer scales. So we will continue, I hope, to have more people employed in paleontology. At the moment, there's about 125 people worldwide who are paid to do research on dinosaurs. When you compare that to other professions, 125 for the entire world just isn't that much, but it's the best it's ever been. I just hope that the trend continues and we see even more people doing research on dinosaurs because we have so much more we can learn. Fossil hunting is for everyone, not just little kids, although little kids certainly have the enthusiasm. But I'm 60 years old and I'm still thrilled about going hunting for dinosaurs, so anybody can be a dinosaur hunter. When I go out, I usually go for day trips. I usually go early in the morning so that it's cool when I'm walking into the area where I want to fossil hunt. And then I spend the entire day there prospecting. And then I walk out in the evening when it's a little cooler. In Alberta, you have to surface collect only. You cannot dig anything up. And you can only surface collect on public land or land where you've gotten permission from the landowners uh, to collect it. The more and more you're out, the better you get at spotting things that are fossilized items in the Badlands, because there's an awful lot of rocks in the Badlands, and so not every rock's gonna be a fossil. And so it's just a matter of training your eye, I guess you would say, to look for certain things and certain colors, because dinosaur bones usually are a different color than the rocks around them. I have a collection that consists of dinosaur teeth and dinosaur claws. I've got an ammonite. All of these items have been collected in the Badlands in Alberta. As a fossil collector or a fossil hunter in the province of Alberta, I am simply a custodian of these fossils. The Alberta government owns the fossils, so I'm just being a caretaker of these fossils in my collection. Bill Bloss is a nice gentleman from Calgary. He's had a passion for dinosaurs since he was a very young man. And now that uh, he's retired, he's got some free time and decided to go fossil hunting. So in the course of one of his uh, ventures in 2015, he stumbled upon the remains of what looked like an articulated leg of a meat-eating dinosaur. Articulated means that all the bones are connected the way they were in life. That got us really excited, reported the find and uh, I took him along with a crew this summer. We went and retrieved the specimen and turned out to be uh, an articulated skeleton of a young tyrannosaur. So that ended up being a very significant discovery and uh, we hope that there's gonna be more surprises uh, that will come out of that find. The sheer number of people who report fossils, I'd say every year we get at least 100 reports of discoveries made by the general public. 
people definitely know that if they find something significant to report their finds because we never know where the next big discovery will be made. There's so many potential sites in the province that paleontologists like me can't go everywhere. We can't be everywhere in the province, even though we'd love to be, but it's impossible. So that's why we rely a lot on the general public. Finding a fossil is a fantastic experience because as soon as you see it, uh, in my case, I know exactly what it is. And just realizing that this animal has lived 60 to 70 million years ago, and I'm the first one that's put my eyes on this particular bone or fossil is quite an exhilarating uh, feeling. And when you find something that the museum thinks is important, that's even better. The Royal Tyrrell Museum is incredibly important from the point of view that we specialize in Western Canadian dinosaurs. So we are one of the primary museums in the world that gathers abundant information about dinosaurs and dinosaur fossils from a very productive part of the world in terms of dinosaurs. One of the really interesting aspects about the history of the museum Although it was built and the doors opened in 1985, not that long ago, just a little over 30 years, the townspeople of Drumheller were pushing the Alberta government to build a dinosaur facility, a museum of some sort here, going right back into the 1940s. So for about 40 years, there was a lobbying effort to build this facility. In a sense, we can actually say that the people of Drumheller were a little bit ahead of the government in terms of seeing the opportunity for tourism, seeing perhaps the opportunity for even science to build a facility like this. It's fantastic. Working at the Royal Toronto Museum, you really get to see paleontology at the forefront. Being a dedicated paleontology museum, we get to have a large group of people who are out in the field collecting fossil material, and often the proprietors are the first people that see this material. So often we're the first person, or the first person ever to touch this material, or it's the first time this material has seen the light of day in 65 or 75 million years, and that's really special and also getting to see the researchers working on cutting edge paleontology. You get to see new species being described and you get to work on that material, which is really neat. In the lab, I'm currently working on a couple of bone bed specimens. That is material from some local sites for disarticulated dinosaur material. On those right now, I'm working on doing some air scribing. Air scribing is using a pneumatic tool, kind of like a little jackhammer, and we use it to remove the matrix from the surface of the bone. So often when we have really hard matrix, we're trying to remove the material, but we need to use something a little bit stronger than a hand tool. So that's when an air scribe would come into it. At the moment, we have two fantastic dinosaur specimens that are being worked on in the large preparation lab. Uh, one of those we've nicknamed the Suncor Nodosaur. That is an armored dinosaur that essentially is a mummified dinosaur. It is preserved with not just the bones in their original position, but also with the skin impressions of the dinosaur intact. So it essentially looks like a sleeping dinosaur. And also the Fort McLeod Leptoceratops, it was collected after the 2013 flooding. It is absolutely phenomenal. It is a three-dimensionally preserved, articulated small dinosaur. It's about the size of a dog. We have a portion of the skull, but the rest of the body is completely intact. It just looks like it lay down to sleep and never woke up. And we have that preserved. I'm Dr. Kayla Brown. I am a researcher at the Royal Terrell Museum of Paleontology. And right now we're in Dinosaur Provincial Park, Alberta, which is one of the best places in the world to find dinosaur bones. And what we're doing right now is what's called field work. And that means we're going out, we're finding new sites, finding new specimens, and we're collecting those for the museum for both research and for display. So the site that we're working today is a hadrosaur or a duckbill dinosaur. It was found two years ago by students on a field trip from Queen Mary University of London. And they found the skull eroding out of the hill. So the museum decided it was a good opportunity to collect that skull because that's where most of the information about the animal is. Most of the really important stuff is in the skull. This bone right here is part of the cheekbone. This is part of the crest. 
and then we have the brain case and some of the lower jaws coming out on this side. Once we started collecting that, we realized most of the skeleton was there. So we're collecting the skeleton as well. Currently, we're in the excavation stage of, of this dinosaur collection. What that means is that we're currently uncovering all the bones, so they're contained in a rock. We're removing that rock, getting down to the surface of the bone, but we don't uncover all of the bone. We only uncover enough to tell what type of bone it is and what type of dinosaur it comes from. And then once that's done, we actually do some mapping. Because it's actually really important, especially in this quarry, how the bones are lying. So what orientation they are, how far they are from other bones, and in this particular case, at what angle they're laying. Mo most often we find bones laying flat. But in this particular case, most of the big bones are laying like that, which actually gives us some hints as to how this animal was deposited back in the Cretaceous. Once we've mapped out those particular bones, we put lots of glue on it to consolidate everything, and then we do what's called a plaster jacket. And this is basically a way that we figured out how to transport the specimen from the ground back to the museum. So we have to make sure that this undercuts it nicely there when it's setting up a bit more. It might be a bit tight. The future of paleontology is an ongoing interface between the fieldwork and new technologies. So it's actually mixing the very low tech of a pickaxe, which hasn't changed in 200 years, and some of the fancy technology, which is brand new each year. And I think the exciting discoveries are gonna be made at that interface between those two areas. Life has been a whirlwind of traveling and doing what I love. I dig in the dirt for a living. And I walk around and I hike and hike and hike. I love it. fossils. It's like they got a sign on them and it says, pick me, pick me. No, just kidding. My eyes observe things differently. You know, I'll see something that stands out and I, sixth sense, I'll, I'll look the right way. You know, it, it's impossible to describe how I do it. I just, it happens. Wendy is an advocational paleontologist. She's got a very sharp eye for finding fossils. Wendy's got a very good eye because, well, she would claim that because she's short. And I think it's just, uh, it's an intuitive, innate ability to recognize interesting shapes and colors when she's walking around that are different than the, the rocks that surround them. She grew up in the Warner area, and since the time that she could walk, she was out walking the Badlands, gathering up scraps of fossils and showing them to paleontologists. She was instrumental in finding the Devil's Coulee nesting site. Back in 1987, a young local girl named Wendy Sloboda was hiking through the Milk River Ridge when she came across what she thought was dinosaur eggshell fragment. Now, she had spent some time in the Royal Tyrell Museum of Paleontology up in Drumheller, so she knew a little bit about what she was looking for. Now, she sent this eggshell fragment up to Dr. Len Hills at the University of Calgary, who confirmed it and sent it to Dr. Philip Curry in the Royal Tyrell Museum. They then sent a team down to investigate the ridge. The team actually managed to find some of these eggs and being the first nesting site in all of Canada, it caused quite an uproar and it was absolutely incredible. Devil's Coulee Dinosaur Egg Site is so significant because we found dinosaur eggs there but also was found dinosaur embryos, babies still inside the eggs and it was the first in Canada. There was also eggs found in Montana but they were hatchlings. These guys were still actually inside the eggs. Devil's Coulee Dinosaur and Heritage Museum is located down in Warner, Alberta. It's a fairly small town, but the museum itself is dedicated to the first dinosaur nesting site ever found in Canada. This is one of the dinosaur egg nests that was collected in Devil's Coulee. They actually laid them in pairs. It's a very important site, and even though the museum itself is small, we make up for our size with full guided interpretive tours. So we are going to be doing something called surface collecting, where we're gonna take a look around and we're going to pick up microfossils, examine them, and then we're going to put them right back where we found them. When we take people out there, they get to experience what it would be like to be a paleontologist going out into the field. We examine fossils that have just barely touched the surface. Oh, a little piece of tooth. Oh, that's a nice one too. The kids get the chance to learn about how these dinosaurs lived, what they did, and how they acted in the world. 
The Devil's Coulee Dinosaur Egg site, it's a special place for me because it kind of set my life on a path and it led me into dinosaurs and that's what I've done since 1987 and it's been a, quite an exciting life. I'm a professional photographer. My biggest thing is I do high action sports photography like motorcycle racing. I've shot PBR, I've shot Red Bull events. Basically, the more exciting and dangerous it is, I like to do it. Looking for dinosaurs and photography tie in really well, especially wildlife photography, which I love to do, because I take my camera and go look for dinosaurs and take pictures of birds and deer and elk. The Southern Alberta area here has a lot of dinosaurs, but when everybody thinks of dinosaurs, they think of Dinosaur Provincial Park or the Drumheller Valley, which in my opinion is kind of good because it, it keeps people away from here and they don't want to flood to try and find dinosaurs. People like to collect dinosaurs and pick up dinosaur bones. If they don't know where they're at, they can't. The Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project, sad P. It looks like a pubis okay. of a small hadrosaur. It's not, not part of our, our, our guy, I don't think. Dr. Michael Ryan and Dr. David Evans are two very good friends of mine. I've worked with them a lot, and I think it's a great project. Um, they're doing a lot of good stuff. Yep, I bet you the head is just tucked right there. They would have a curved back, be about that long, the neck. The Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project is a multi-year collaborative research project between myself at the Royal Ontario Museum and my colleague, Dr. Michael Ryan at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History in association with colleagues here at the Royal Trail Museum, uh, the University of Alberta and, and uh, other institutions. And our goal is to study some pretty remote areas of uh, Southern Alberta, like here along the Milk River Valley fill in gaps in our knowledge of the dinosaur fossil record of Alberta to better understand how dinosaurs are evolving and changing leading up to that end Cretaceous mass extinction. This looks like, uh, actually, like it might be two bones. That looks... Dinosaurs actually are important for understanding what's going on in our modern world today. The work that we're doing here doesn't help us save individual species or individual animals today, but it puts the scale of how we're affecting our environment and our world and our global ecosystem today in an important historical perspective. And when you look at the rates of extinction that we're experiencing today, they are approaching the rates that we see in these big five mass extinction events, including the 166 million years ago that resulted in the collapse that wiped out the big dinosaurs. And so dinosaurs in their world are extremely important for understanding how the world will be affected by mass extinction, in our case, human-caused mass extinction. A lot of our big finds here in Southern Alberta are owed to Wendy Sloboda. She is one of the very best fossil hunters anywhere in the world. She has over 3,000 fossils to her name in the collections of the Royal Trail Museum, and she has definitely found most of our good specimens. We actually joke that we're Wendy's cleanup crew out here, and that's because she runs around and finds great stuff, and then fortunately for us, we have to go and, and dig up these great specimens. The story of Wendy Ceratops is, is like many for Wendy Sloboda. I mean, she found um, this amazing site, we came and dug it up, and it happened to be a, a brand new and important species of dinosaur. And so we thought it was about time to, to name one after her in recognition of her amazing talent and contributions to Alberta paleontology. And so that's where the name Wendy Ceratops comes from. And I told them if I was gonna save this spot on my arm for a tattoo of my dinosaur if they ever named one after me. Well, they obliged me and named this dinosaur after me, and they called it Wendy Ceratops pinhornensis. And it's a ceratopsian, and it has a very unique frill, and it's got spikes that droop forward. They said they compare it to my dreads. It's on display at the Royal Ontario Museum right now. It's pretty neat. I got to go out and see it in January, mounted and everything. It's a pretty cool little dinosaur. 
we actually made an exhibit around the discovery of Wendy Ceratops and how scientists go about identifying new species in the fossil record. So we actually have a full-scale reconstruction of Wendy Ceratops. We actually have the first bone that Wendy found in the ground, and we have some of the key original fossils that highlight that incredible story. To have a dinosaur named after you is one of the biggest honors that anybody in paleontology can have. I was pretty excited and still today when I hear them say Wendy Ceratops is just like shake my head. It's still kind of weird to hear it and to know that that's my dinosaur. My hope for the future of paleontology is that it continues to grow. We have so much more to discover and I think the Southern Alberta Dinosaur Project shows that you can get a lot out of an area like Alberta that many people would think is uh, you know, has been basically played out. And uh, there are so many places like this all over the world that paleontologists have barely scratched the surface on. And I'd like to see a bigger next generation explore more areas and find out more things, fill in those gaps, and give us a better understanding of the history of life on Earth. Dinosaurs have kept me active. It's helping me stay younger, and, and every year I want to go out and find more and more and more and more, and it's fun. I enjoy it. It's good for my health. It's rewarding. It's, it's just everything. 20 years from now, hopefully I'll be looking for dinosaurs still. When I see the dinosaur tracks here at Grand Cache, I'm completely in awe. They are the most magnificent fossil locality that I've ever seen. It's just so dramatic when you see it. When the sun hits them just right, the footprints just jump out at you, and it's, it's awe-inspiring to see them. The tracks, the setting, even the town of Grand Cache, it's one of my favorite places to come and see, and I would certainly recommend that anybody who has the opportunity should come and, and see the tracks for themselves. Grand Cache Dinosaur Track Site is located about 20 kilometers north of the town of Grand Cache, about an hour and a half south of Grand Prairie. They're located in the middle of a coal mine that's currently being mined by a Grand Cache Coal Company. The tracks in this area are 100 million years old. They're from the middle Cretaceous, uh, Albion stage of the uh, Cretaceous. When they were formed, they were at sea level. There used to be an ocean to the east and to the northeast as well. So it would have been a much different climate than it was today, very warm. The first tracks were found in this mine back in the, in the late 80s, and that was by a combination of uh, visiting geologists and also some of the people that worked for the coal mine. They notified the Terrell Museum, and Terrell sent a couple expeditions up to do initial survey work. And then I took it on as a master's project, and through the whole time I've had fantastic access it's been a great place to study and learn about fossil dinosaurs and other vertebrates because it's all here. There's thousands and thousands of footprints and there's all kinds of different preservations, lots of different behaviors. And since there's 25 different sites in the mine, many of them represent different types of environments. So you get to see that certain animals had environmental preferences or tolerances and there's uh, certain environments that other animals tended to avoid. We came into the mine yesterday and uh, spotted this, uh, this slab here, which has a lot of little avian uh, footprints, so little footprints of birds. This site has a pretty big diversity of track types and animals that made the tracks. It includes uh, large theropod dinosaurs, probably some type of an allosaurid, not allosaurus itself, but one of its descendants. There's also at least three types of medium-sized uh, dinosaurs, and we're not sure of the identity of those. There's one type of small meat-eating dinosaur as well, a small theropod that was likely an ornithomimid because of the long paces and stride. It was the speed demon. We also have probably five or six types of avian tracks, including uh, tracks of small shorebirds and also larger wading birds that would have resembled uh, cranes. And finally, we have crocodilian uh, swim tracks. Dinosaur tracks right at the base here that you can see. And some of them are infilled. Like this one here is, a, uh, is an ankylosaur foot and handprint. So it's a quadrupedal dinosaur. So there's the heel, and there's one of the digits, one of the outer digits. 
and another digit, and another digit. There's probably a fourth one in here. These dinosaur tracks here at Grand Cache were found directly as a result of the mining by Smoky River coal, and to some extent, Grand Cache coal as well. And there are other industries, uh, oil and gas, oil sands, that are also turning up fossils, not necessarily dinosaur tracks, but they are finding fossils as well. The big thing is they're finding these fossils, they're bringing them to our attention. So they're not just being lost or tucked away somewhere in a mine, somewhere never to be seen by science. They're finding them and they're calling us. We have lots of meat eaters, we have some plant eaters, we have birds, we have crocs. So let's go take a look at the tracks because that's what you came here for. Over the next few days, uh, I'm going to be leading a couple of tours, and what the tours are designed to do is to get a bit of an interest in having some sort of tourism interpretive facility or program established at these sites. As each one erodes, it exposes the next layer of tracks. These sites are one of Canada's best kept secrets, and it's uh, actually uh, would do them justice to have more people uh, see and appreciate them. Can you guys see this? Okay, that's a left footprint. Of, a, of an ankylosaur. The handprint's right here. This is the right footprint, handprint. Left, right, left, right, all the way across. It's an opportunity to diversify and open up these, uh, these sites to the public. Grand Cache Coal is, is not opposed to opening these sites. I mean, it's not our land to begin with. We're just temporarily borrowing it. And if we can fit that into a reclamation plan and a reclamation strategy as a long-term end goal, I, I think it's a win-win for both us and the public. The density for footprints on this layer is about 100 per square meter. So a square you know, meter by meter, 100, 100 tracks. So this is a very densely uh, populated uh, surface. This attraction here is going to be very welcome to the economy of Grand Cache. At the present time, the economy is not that great here in Grand Cache with mines shutting down and problems in the forest industry. It could be a lifesaver for the town of Grand Cache. I see it as somewhere where people can stop and take a break in the middle of their day as they're traveling. They can stop and have lunch in the downtown. They can take a bus, come on up and see the dino tracks and just have little kids use their imagination on what they can see up here. There is an avian trackway, a bird trackway, that is right in line with that theropod trackway that's coming down. It's an interesting trackway because it's walking like a bird, so it's making short paces and strides, so the, and very toed in, very pigeon toed. That's how the trackway starts. It's going, you know, right, left, right, very short pace and stride. As the trackway progresses, the pace and stride increase and the footprints straighten out, and then it ends. <laughs> so what do you think might have happened? Yeah. Or it flew away. I think the. People will come here to see these tracks in conjunction with the Dinosaur Museum that's already operational at Wembley. It's not that far away. And the attraction appears to be to the younger generation. They're in love with dinosaurs and anything associated with dinosaurs. The Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum in the Grand Prairie region is something that opened in 2015. People think that I have a lot to do with that museum. Well, I don't. I mean, it's something that was named in honor of me uh, because I've done a lot of work in the Grand Prairie region looking for dinosaurian resources. The idea of building a museum, though, goes back a long way. It was already in the 1970s that people started talking about the fact that Grand Prairie needed some more local museum that was going to display dinosaurs found in that region of the province. And uh, basically, it represents not just the Grand Prairie region, but the whole of northwestern Alberta. The museum offers technological tools that allow people to engage with the exhibits in a way that a lot of museums don't offer. So a lot of virtual reality viewers to bring creatures back to life from the Cretaceous. There are microscopes they can look at tiny fossils and understand ecological systems that are long gone. They can interact with CT scanning devices that allow them to look inside a dinosaur's head. There's lots of things like that.
When visitors come to the Philip J. Curry Dinosaur Museum, during the summer we offer tours out to the Pipestone Creek site, so visitors can, can come and go on a guided hike through the campground and to the site itself, talking about the paleontology of the region and being able to see the bone bed. And if you're very lucky, uh, if it happens to be during one of our field stints where we're actually working the site, uh, we may be at the, the bone bed itself. We have worked for a long time in the Grand Prairie area on one particular bone bed. It was found by a school teacher in the mid-1970s. This turned out to be a bone bed that is a place where you get many, many individual animals that are buried in the same place. In this particular case, the bone bed represented a mass death of a herd of horned dinosaurs, and the horned dinosaur is called Pachyrhinosaurus. So far, we've excavated the skulls of more than 25 specimens out of that one bone bed. But it's also one of the richest bone beds I know of anywhere in the world for dinosaurs. We were getting up to 300 bones per cubic meter out of that bone bed, and the bone bed stretches for more than 400 meters that we know of. So we've got work to do for probably another 100 years there in terms of excavating that bone bed and finding new information about Pachyrhinosaurus. We still haven't figured out why the animals are all there, uh, what caused this mass death, and so on. So we continue to excavate that bone bed looking for new evidence. Alberta is known worldwide as um, one of the richest sources of dinosaur fossils anywhere. Perhaps people take it a bit for granted because uh, the faunas are relatively well known. People have been doing field work in Alberta for a long time. And I think with the field work we're doing in the Grand Prairie area, that will hopefully open up another part of Alberta's fossil record to international attention and show people that there's yet another side to Alberta's fossil richness. Grand Prairie is relatively a, a newer area in terms of paleontology in Alberta. There has been work done there in the past, but it's been fairly limited. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because there's very little exposure of the rock up there. Most of the landscape is covered in crops and forests, fields, that kind of thing. So it's difficult to prospect up there. There's less areas that you can get to easily to look for fossils. However, when we do go to those areas and search the rocks, we find fossils there, and we find a lot of fossils there. In Grand Prairie, we know that there are two very common dinosaurs, um, a ceratopsian called Pachyrhinosaurus and a hadrosaur called Edmontosaurus. So we expect to find more of those, and that would be interesting. Um, but I think the more um, scientifically significant possibility is uh, finding additional animals. And we have bits and pieces of them. We know that there are several theropods, for example, meat-eating dinosaurs in that area because we find teeth and other fragments that show they're there. We know that beyond dinosaurs, there are turtles and these crocodile-like animals called champsosaurs. And there's every reason to expect that we'll find members of other dinosaur groups, potentially lizards, potentially crocodilians. So we just need to get out there and find more sites and get to know this Cretaceous fauna better and simply what was going on in the Grand Prairie area during the late Cretaceous. If there's one thing our planet desperately needs, it's people to be able to connect with their natural world and their heritage. And we try and do that with everything we do here in Tumbler Ridge. Tumbler Ridge is a beautiful, remote little community of just 3,000 people in northeastern British Columbia. It's British Columbia's youngest, therefore newest community. It was created out of nothing in the early 1980s entirely because of the metallurgical coal that occurs here. And we've been through huge ups and downs with coal mines coming and closing and coming and closing. 
We've got a fairly big UNESCO global geopark. It's about 8,000 square kilometers. And there are two arms that have allowed us to get this coveted designation. The one is 100 kilometers of hiking trails that go to these beautiful geological sites, all with a geological story to tell. And the other one is the Tumbler Ridge Museum Foundation with the Peace Region Paleontology Research Center with all the dinosaur and other fossil heritage which we have discovered here. In Tumbler Ridge, we have the Dinosaur Discovery Gallery. And this is where we showcase all of the great fossils that we've collected in the Peace Region. And we also have examples of Tumbler Ridge's favorite, the Ankylosaur, the armored dinosaur. We have several footprints of that out on display. And we also have on display a very small sample from our Tyrannosaur trackway. It's the world's only Tyrannosaur trackway, and we have just enough room to fit one of the footprints into one of the cabinets for people to see, and it is a massive footprint. I got involved with uh, Tumblr Ridge uh, as a result of two boys finding a trackway. That led to the discovery of the dinosaur excavation site, the first dinosaur bones in British Columbia. That's how we built the museum, is be because of those bones. Everyone was predicting ghost town status for us. It was such a serendipitous discovery, and as a dad, I just realized, you know, maybe the kids have got an opportunity to do something cool here. The public component of the museum is the tip of the iceberg, so the, the collections is really massive. It is the only type of collection of its kind in the province of British Columbia. So where we're standing right now is the collections facility for the Peace Region Paleontology Research Centre. So this is the fossil archives for the area. So all of the fossils that we go out into the field and we collect, we bring them back here and we clean them up and then we do all of the studies on them and this is where they get stored. I want people to look at paleontology and fossils specifically and not just say, oh, it's just some dusty old bone on a shelf. I want them to be in awe of this millions of years old specimen that they're looking at and go, wow, that is part of our past. This is part of my story. I want people to get more connected with paleontology. I think with paleontology in Tumblr Ridge, we have now reached a critical mass. In the early days, our future was not by any means secure, but I think our reputation has grown and spread to such a degree that we can now speculate, you know, where are we going to be? Uh, we, we need to be internationally recognized. We've got a dinosaur bone bed, which we cannot excavate without funding. Currently, we know there are at least four dinosaurs there. We've got six thigh bones, but with some funding, there might be 100, 200, 300 dinosaurs right there. The only Tyrannosaur trackways in the world they lead into a, a small cliff. With the backhoe and a bobcat, if you could get those there with funding, take off the overburden. Can you imagine Tyrannosaur trackways that just go on and on and on? What an international draw card that would be. I know that what we're doing here is not just provincially or nationally important, but it's internationally significant stuff, and heritage is critical. The track site that we're currently working on is near Hudson's Hope, uh, just south of the Williston Reservoir. It was discovered in 2008 by a local person named Barry Moreau. As we rode by on the quad, we noticed this exposed slab of rock with strange depressions in it that, that seemed to be indicating a pattern of footsteps. When we jumped off the quad and walked over and looked is when we really discovered that, yes, they were dinosaur tracks. These footprints are 115 million years old, so we're dealing with early Cretaceous dinosaurs. We're in the beginning stages, but we've already found about nine or ten different track types. So we have the footprints of large, medium, small theropods, those are the meat-eating dinosaurs. We have a few size ranges of plant-eating dinosaurs, the ornithopods, and we have at least one sauropod trackway. And we may have possibly the traces of uh, things like birds and maybe some other smaller animals like that. The plan this year is to excavate as much of the 6,000 square meter area as possible. The very first thing that we do is we have to clean off the site. We have to get all of the extra crud off of the surface. The step two is once we've uncovered the surface is to give it the big brush off. So we sweep all of the debris off of the surface so that we have a nice clean slate to work with. 
they all weren't on the surface at the same time. We can tell that because of the differences in preservation. So it wasn't one big dinosaur stampede, but just a fairly dense amount of trackways being built up, just a number of dinosaurs walking across and then some more walking across a little later and then some after that. Now that's the type of thing that we're gonna, we're gonna be looking at and seeing if we can determine what the sequence was, like which ones came first, which ones came second, which directions they were going in. Was a particular group of dinosaur, did they have a preferred sort of orientation? Were they heading somewhere specific or is it all random? For the past week, we've had visitors from many different parts of the world. These are all people who are interested in various aspects of dinosaur footprints, and especially early Cretaceous dinosaur footprints. So we form an international dinosaur footprint team, so we're working on various aspects of the site. I thought when we got here, we'd see one or two or three or four footprints uh, and then we'd be you know think this is great we're up to 800 footprints already and in the last week uh, we've exposed you know I think a few hundred ourselves this is authentic dinosaur action I'm totally blown away I didn't think I'd ever see anything like this and just the diversity of different animals that are here the different types hey guys I got two ornithopods here that kind of um turn in unison. Ooh. Ooh. Somebody once said that fossil footprints are the nearest thing we have to movies of dinosaurs. And I like to tease my friends who study bones and say, you're studying death, destruction, decay, putrefaction. We're studying the living, dynamic, athletic animal. This one comes down here. I thought that was a theropod at first, but it's not. And then it's here, here, here. The three-dimensional data set that I'll produce from the work I do here at this track site can be thought of kind of as a base layer. And from that, we can look at which animal walk across the surface first. We can look at how the footprints are connected into trackways. From making those measurements, we can estimate how fast the animals were going. One of the standard things we say about footprints is that they represent the animals that actually came into this area. Sometimes if you find a dinosaur skeleton, it may have been washed hundreds of miles down a river, uh, it may have been scavenged and transported around. You don't know how representative it is. On July 8th, we had an unveiling of the dinosaur track site. And this was to raise awareness of paleontology resources that are in the Peace Region, and specifically this site. Thank you to everybody for, for coming. And uh, we're gonna be working on this site probably until uh, mid to late August. So anybody that feels like coming out and uh, just checking out the site or working with us, you're more than welcome. We have this wonderful opportunity, not just for paleontology heritage protection, but also to combine that with tourism, because this is one of the few sites that people can actually visit that shows a whole lot of dinosaur footprints on one surface. We've had this area exposed. This was the area where the tracks were first found. And of course, we're saying that we want to expose all the way up to the trees. But you know, when we bring people here, they're like, well, how do you know there's tracks up there? So we excavated a little area, and now we have the proof. So let's go take a look. Exploration. With this current track site that we're working on, we're not discouraging the public from visiting. It's not something that we're advertising, but we're quite happy to show them around, and it's nice to see how enthusiastic they are about what's out here. And vertebrates often put most of their, carry most of their weight on the inside, on their instep. What we'd love to have happen for this surface is for a lovely building to be put over it, a nice interpretive center, and to have the track's story told, to uh, have wonderful displays inside and be able to share this site with everyone who comes to the area. It's fascinating because these are animals that just aren't here anymore, but they left such a huge impact on our planet. And they were just like any other animal that was around today, all the cougars and the moose and the bears, and interacting with their environment and leading their lives and having their impacts and just being able to 
tell their story and be part of preserving them and making that story available to the public. It's humbling and a great honor all at the same time. My hope for the future is that I'll get to see a number of museums in British Columbia built that have more of a paleontological focus and that this interest in paleontology becomes ingrained in the society of all British Columbians, that there's an awareness that there isn't now.